Good morning, brothers and sisters. Very happy Sabbath to all. This morning, we're going to cover some additional items that we had not covered this last Sabbath. And there will be some other additions to this presentation. Hopefully, we will find this to be a time that we are able to find to praise God for his, his guidance, his direction, and thank him for his constant, cautious leadership for us whose minds are not finite, who do not have the wisdom that he does to direct us so that we may truly come together and be united to give this message that is to be given to this world at this time. Shall we now pray? Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you on this Sabbath, we thank you for the many opportunities that you have provided us to learn more of you, to be guided of you, to be directed of you, so that we may be unified, so that we may be prepared as you prepared our forefathers, the disciples, our forefathers, the Millerites, to begin to receive the outpouring of your spirit. We seek to welcome your spirit, Father. We seek to welcome you. We seek to welcome you in that we accept that which Christ has done on our behalf. Help us that our hearts may be filled with praise. Help us that we may be prepared to give a message that you would have us to give at this time for this earth so that this earth may understand the need that we have to fear you, to give glory to you, for the hour of your judgment has indeed come. Direct us now to this end. Bless us as we open your word. Show us that that we need to understand, Father, so that we may truly come together in spirit and in truth before you, so that your message may be given by a people that are prepared to give this message. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, part of what I have been led to do to begin this session is to share a bit. We, as a people, do not often give time for prayer and praise. Yet, our Heavenly Father is leading us in many ways that we need to recognize. We need to accept For we are told we are to praise him in all things. Is this not correct? Correct. Now, as we praise him in all things, are we to praise him in times of blessing and in times of trial? Yeah, especially in these times of trial. This last week was kind of interesting for me. So I'm going to I'm going to give you a personal testimony. There've been many been many things where God has blessed and has blessed well. This last week I came under some interesting trials. 
As many of you are aware, I've had to ask of the Lord, am I to go forward in having a surgery that is done according to the wisdom of man? At this point, I had been rescheduled to go back for an additional assessment on my eyes to address whether or not I should agree to proceed. Now, many of us have had to have eye exams. It's interesting because what man uses to address their need to examine another creation of our Heavenly Father are items that are not sometimes naturally occurring. The eye exam that I underwent, I've undergone before, where drops were placed into my eye so that my eyes would then be dilated so that the doctor could then see what they wanted to see inside of my eyes. Now, I don't experience what many do, where after these drops are placed in the eye, within about four hours, your eyes return to normal. I've experienced where normally, after I've had these drops, that it's going to take a day, sometimes a little bit more for this to occur. The doctor assessed that my eyes are getting worse. The doctor was being very direct. He wants me to agree to the surgery as quickly as possible. Now, I listened carefully. I left the clinic. Within an hour, I had a case of hives all over my body where I itched. I was unable to truly function. I was having problems. I called the clinic back. And I said, I'm having a reaction to the eye drops. Their first response is, that's not possible. Well, I'm going to talk to the doctor. I will I, I hold, hold on the phone. Well, the doctor says that it's not possible. You cannot be having a reaction to these eye drops. We suggest you go to the emergency room. I shook my head. But instead, I asked, what am I to do, Father? There have been many times in my, in my life that I've heard a voice. One of those times that I remember hearing this voice, and I he remember hearing it directly, was on September 11th, 2001. I was told to watch carefully. I was told to pay attention. I don't think there's anyone within this movement or within this world at this point that does not recall the events of September 11, 2001. As this went forward, I was led to go to the emergency room. Now, in this situation, I was seen by a doctor. The doctor looked at me, he examined me, and came back with the diagnosis that you are having a severe allergic reaction. His recommendation was that I should take Benadryl, but he was going to write me two prescriptions. 
one for a topical steroid and the other for an internal steroid. In the past, I've taken steroids. I do not like what they do to me. The doctor also gave me a pill. He explained after I had taken this pill, and I'm, I'm speaking a couple of days later, that this was an antacid. He gave me the chemical name and then gave me the, the sales name of Prevacid. But that this also had some histamine blockers in it to try to reduce the effect of what was occurring. That pill sat like a weight upon my stomach. I drank some fruit juice. It didn't make it better. I spent Tuesday night and all day Wednesday with a stomach that was in pain. I was unable to keep even water down. Now, I felt a little bit better on Thursday. I had some things that had to be accomplished business-wise. I left on Thursday. Went to do the work. I found I could not eat very much. At best, I might be able to get four or five bites of a, a, a fairly bland soup or even of oatmeal without pain in my stomach. On my way back, because I had a, a fairly long three-hour drive out, three-hour drive back, my truck broke down. I wound up needing to be towed. I wound up being towed and returned back at 4 a.m. Friday morning. So this last week, I barely slept. I was left with a situation for Friday morning. How do we place God first? How do we handle these things when we are in a situation when we really don't know what we are to do? Placing God first is our best most direct avenue to be able to receive his word and receive his direction. If we will not do this, if we wish to rely upon our own wisdom, we are no better than the world. Now, we're going to finish some presentation from this last week and go on hopefully into a couple of others. This presentation may take a little longer than normal. It is not that I am disrespecting anybody, but that we as a people are going to need to consider carefully that which God would have us to do. I praise God for the opportunities that I've had this week to be able to address with others that which God would want shared. I was able to have a good conversation with the tow driver who was very apologetic because all of the promises that their company made failed. I was able to, to share a bit with a physician. What turned out to be the issue behind the hives, behind the severe allergic reaction, is the fact that most eye drops that are currently being used 
in and with these practices are made from a synthetic derivative of nightshade. Aren't they from belladonna? That I couldn't say. Okay, that's what I found. Okay. Belladonna. The issue that I ran into, and the reason I, I was able to put this together, in the years of my life, I've had to learn that I do not handle man-made synthetic vitamins or other items very well. Years past, I had to have treatment for a skin condition. And one of the doctors <clears throat> that I was seeing at that point prescribed man-made vitamin A. I was a test subject for a couple of different treatments. The man-made vitamin A blew me up like a very fleshy balloon. In the middle of the summer, after having these treatments, I could find no comfort because my skin was so very hot to the touch. The situation that had addressed itself with this with the eye doctor became very clear because in four of the meals before I had the eye exam, I had had some white potatoes. I had had some roasted red peppers. <clears throat> I had enjoyed these and I'd had some tomatoes, all of which were of the nightshade family, all of which contributed to the issues. What the physician told me after our second visit was that he was very surprised because he didn't expect that fast of a reduction in the hives, given how severe this reaction had been with me. In these situations, I take a very Greek attitude. Let your food be your medicine, let your medicine be your food. At this point, I have been told that while things may entice me to eat them, I may have to go on a very liquid diet for the next several days. I should stay hydrated. I should not worry too much about nutrition because there is a concern over why an antacid something that is supposed to reduce the acidity within a system is now actually increasing it. I praise God for his opportunities because in this, are we not shown that the health message is the right arm of the third angel's message? Are we not given the opportunity to share this in various ways with others in this world where we may be able to reach them in unexpected ways? Now, I know that this is a, a departure from what we have been dealing with over these last several months. But I praise God for these opportunities to be able to share. I praise him for the opportunity of being able to give testimony. If anyone else would like to share or give testimony, I will open the floor at this time. And then we will go into our study after that.
I will not press. Consider, though, that each of us will at times have things <clears throat> that we will need to share to encourage the faith of others, to encourage those in the movement, to encourage those that we come in contact with day by day. Returning to the document that Mrs. White provided through the Review and Herald on the 16th of December of 1890, we come to paragraph 21, which we did not cover last week. To you, to your friends, you may now so represent your course of action as to make a pretty fair showing for yourselves. This is a paragraph that is written after what we covered last week, where she had stated, if you indulge in stubbornness of heart and through pride and self-righteousness do not confess your faults, you will be left subject to Satan's temptations. If when the Lord reveals your errors, you do not repent or make confession, his providence will bring you over the ground again and again. You will be left to make mistakes of a similar character. You will continue to lack wisdom and will call sin righteousness and will call righteousness sin. The multitude of deceptions that will prevail in these last days will encircle you and you will charge, change leaders and not know that you have done so. We are not here to change leaders. We are not here to abandon that which has been shown to be for us the old paths, the paths to walk in, the paths for this time. To one who does not know the objectionable features of your character, it may be an easy matter for you to present plausible excuses for your indecision, your unwillingness to confess your sins. But how will these excuses stand with him who judges righteously? Will you present the same reasoning when you are brought before the tribunal of God, when the eye of the Lord is fixed upon you? and the angels of heaven are looking on? It is thus that every man's account must be yielded up. What, then, can any of you gain by being untrue to himself, giving to others a representation which you could not in any case lay before God? Can we lie to God? This is the guy that knows all and sees all. I don't think so. Okay. The Lord reads every secret of the heart. There is nothing that is hidden from him. He knows all things. You may now close the book of your remembrance in order to escape confessing your sins. But when the judgment shall sit and the book shall be opened, you cannot close them. Brothers and sisters, where is this warning found? What do you mean? Where? Isn't it in that paper that you're just displaying? Okay, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask us a different way. How about that? Are we given a warning to address so that we may more clearly understand the time in which we are living? Are you referring to the three angels' messages? No, I'm not. I don't know. However, counsel that this has been giving here, is that what you mean? If we were to open scripture and we were to go to Revelation 
3, verse 7. which is the letter to the church of Philadelphia. And what does it mean to be of Philadelphia? Oh, brother, they love. Sorry. What has been the subject of our time together these last several Sabbaths? Brotherly love. Revelation 3, verse 7 tells us, And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Is there anything about the numerical representation of this verse to which we should pay attention? Let's see it. It's kind of small. Revelation 3, verse 7. Oh. How many members of the Godhead are there? Three. And yet, what is the subject of Leviticus 26? Uh, the curse seven times. The seven times. And if we were to do very simple mathematics, what is three multiplied by seven? 21. And how, how does that relate to where we are now? Is not 21 the representation of midnight? The need for brotherly love amongst our people today is part and parcel of the midnight cry. We need to come into this understanding more clearly now than we have ever addressed in the past. The recording angel has testified that which is true. All that you have tried to conceal and forget is registered and will be read to you when it is too late for wrongs to be righted. Then you will be overwhelmed with despair. Oh, it is a terrible thing that so many are trifling with eternal interests, choosing the heart against closing the heart, excuse me, against any course of action which shall involve confession. You who have erred and made crooked paths for your feet, so that others who look to you for an example have been turned out of the way, have you no confession to make? You, have, you who have sowed doubts and unbelief in the hearts of others, who have nothing to say to God or to your brethren, review your course for years of the past. You who have not formed a habit of confessing your sins. Consider your words, consider your attitude. You whose influence has counteracted the message of the Spirit of God. You that have despised both the message and the messenger. After seeing the fruit borne by the message, what have you to say? Weigh your spirit, your actions in the balance of eternal justice, the law of God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and thy neighbor as thyself, Matthew 22, 37 to 39. Unless your sins are canceled, they will testify against you 
at that day when every work shall pass in review before God. How many of us want our sins to testify against us? How many of us will be able to stand at that time if our sins are, are at that time testifying against us? Confession would break up the follow ground of the heart. It would rid you of your pride and your self-complacency. While you neglect this work, wonder not that the Holy Spirit has not softened your heart and led you into all truth. God could not have blessed you without sanctioning sin and confirming you in unbelief. You have been deceiving yourselves and deceiving others, and the Holy Spirit will never by its work or witness make God a liar. What is the work of the Holy Spirit? To convict us of sin and to sanctify us as we yield to him. We are to be convicted of sin, right? Does not the Holy Spirit convict us of sin? Yes, it does. Okay. Away with your quibbling and your cabling. Say not with a smile. It is not expected that any man can be perfect. That you do not claim to be inspired. This is a pitiable mask. What is the need of the Holy Spirit if it teaches you only what your finite judgment already assents to? What is the purpose of the Spirit if it's just an agreement with man's judgment? In his providence, God has followed up his written word with testimonies of warning to lead you to the truth of his word. He has pitied the ignorance of man. He has pitied the proud, rebellious soul and has presented help to lead you away from unbelief to truth. If you would be led. God has loved you too well to spare your feelings. He has given you warnings and reproofs to save you, but you have made light of the warnings and entreaties and have refused to heed them. Will you seek the Lord during this week of prayer? Will you humble the heart before God, confess your sins and find mercy and forgiveness? I just Teach you, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Look in faith to the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. It is not now too late for wrongs to be righted. Christ invites you to come and take of the water of life freely. Let no man deceive you with the sophistry that excuses sin. Let every man who makes light of the warnings and reproofs of the Spirit of God that you dare not do this yourself any longer. That although the eyes of your understanding have been blinded, and you have been misled and have come to wrong decisions, you will not be deceived and blinded any longer. Come out of the cave and stand with God on the mount and see what God has to say to you. 
who was called out of the cave? Who was called to hear what God would say to him? Elijah. Elijah, very definitely. Are we not to be as Elijah to this world, giving a final message of warning? Uh, well, that's what we have studied and learned. Have implicit faith in God and do not depend upon self. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Psalm 32, verses 1, 2, and 5. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God. Thou wilt not despise. Psalm 51, 17. Who is it that wrote Psalm 51? Oh, uh, David, David. And why did he write this? The Lord. Well, it was after um, the sin with the Bathsheba and that being exposed as far as, and also the killing of um, Uriah. Uriah, yeah. If we break one commandment, we have broken them all. This was revealed to David. This was shown to David. And as it was revealed, he made the ultimate sacrifice of the broken spirit. He was willing that his heart should be right before God so that he could then become right before his nation. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Isaiah fifty seven fifteen, And to all who seek him with true repentance, God gives the assurance. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Isaiah 44, 22. These promises are full of comfort and of hope, and of peace. Now, <clears throat> part of this, as the Lord led, we are now need to look at letter 16 of 1861, written to the church at Roosevelt, New York. This was a largely unpublished document written August 3, 1861. Pay attention, please, to the date of this letter. Consider, please, the events that are addressed, but also the upcoming events of this time 
that are not addressed. 1861 was a tumultuous year. 1861 was a year in which there was a great division within this great nation. That division was whether or not this nation that had been established by God could then continue. So we have much to look at. We have much to consider. Dear brethren and sisters, the state of the church was presented before me. I saw many things in a tangled, perplexed condition. I was shown that God would not condescend to unravel every difficulty and explain every trial. The brethren and sisters are, many of them, unconsecrated and when individual wrongs are reproved some stand prepared to triumph over those who are reproved this letter written at that time is just as pertinent to us today on account of these things god will not reveal many church difficulties for many interpret the visions to suit their own peculiar ideas. And God is grieved. His church is weakened. And the cause is dishonored by childish contentions and by misinterpreting what he has seen fit to reveal. I saw that God would soon remove all light given through visions unless they were appreciated and the church made better use of them than what they have done. When did God finally remove the public visions? Was it not in 1884 in Portland, Oregon? Uh, yeah. 23 years later. This, the church must search carefully in meekness and with humble hearts for their own wrongs, which have separated God from them. They must remember that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Self-justification must be laid aside and all possess yielding spirits. This is not just to the leadership. This is not just to the membership. All must lay aside self-justification. All must possess yielding spirits. As I write, matters come plainly to my mind. I was shown some individual cases. Brother Pangborn's family lacks consecration. Brother Pangborn does not understand himself. He needs a thorough work of reformation. His temperament is fitful. It is changeable. He moves from impulse. He does not possess the heavenly adorning, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. He must be converted before he can progress. A profession of the truth will avail him nothing. He must show by his fruits that he is a follower of the meek and lowly Savior. He possesses a hasty and self-important spirit and does not control his own spirit. He looks out carefully for his own interest, sometimes greatly to the, the disadvantage of his brethren. He can never prosper and live in the light until he has a care and interest for his brethren and is willing to be reproved and instructed by them. 
he lacks the nobleness of soul becoming the profession of his faith. Brother Pangborn thinks his brethren have misused him because they have spoken of his faults. Brother Pangborn, you are at fault. You cause yourself trouble. You do not control yourself in your family or with your brethren. You are the greatest enemy you have. When you control yourself and possess a noble, generous spirit, becoming a follower of Jesus, you will have peace, union, and love with your brethren, and you can make thorough work. You are fluctuating and do not move from cool judgment. You must thoroughly reform or be weighed in the balance and found wanting. Where would we find that? Daniel 5. Excuse me? Daniel chapter 5. Is this not many, many tekel you farsen? Yes. And what symbol do we take from this? Do we not take the symbol of 126? Giving us an interrelation with the seven times of Leviticus 26? Yes. The following sentence is telling. Your brethren can have no fellowship with your spirit until you give evidence of a genuine work and bring forth fruits to God's glory. I was shown the case of Brother Edson that he should not think that because God's afflicting hand is upon him that his anger is kindled against him. I saw that Brother Edson has taxed his physical strength until it was exhausted, prostrated, but God loves him, and if he will lean upon him, he will bring him up. He will not forsake him now. I saw that God regarded the sacrifice made by him and Sister Edson. They had sacrificed for the good of the cause of God and had left their pleasant house and farm, and he had stood as one of the Lord's minutemen, to use his means to advance the cause of present truth. And now adversity and affliction have come upon him. Who is this? Should we choose to examine, I think we, we would find that this is Brother Hiram Edson. This is written as an encouragement Five years after the articles that he was to have presented outlining the seven times of Leviticus 26. Satan has been permitted to afflict and annoy him that if possible, their minds might be carried back to that pleasant farm and they regret the sacrifice they have made. Who else was the adversary allowed to afflict and annoy that we are shown in Scripture? Who else? Job. Thank you. And was it not that Job was also looking back to the time when his children surrounded him and he did not have such affliction? 
What did Job do at that time? You mean after? I mean after, yes. Covered himself with sackcloth and ashes. But did he not throughout this praise God? Yes, the whole time. Is this not the example we are to follow? We're supposed to. Satan has not gained his object in thus afflicting. God designs to bring the family nearer to him. He has not left or forsaken them. He will bring them through the furnace purified and refined if they will lean upon him and trust in him. What a promise this is to us. What an admonition it is to us today. The state of God's cause has affected the courage of brother and sister Edson, yet God has his eye upon them and will visit them in mercy. They should have the sympathy and the love of their brethren, and they should favor him. We are being given examples of this occurring at this time, just as it occurred in the past. The case of Brother Manley Ross was presented before me. I saw he intended to be true and right. He has a work to do. There is danger of some misconstruing Brother Manley's frank manner. He must possess a willing spirit to acknowledge his wrongs and must not justify himself and brace himself against his brethren but yield to their judgment, to their counsel, and to their advice. The church must be subject one to another, willing to be counseled, willing to be reproved, and willing to be directed by the body. Dear self is the most obstinate person the follower of Jesus has to contend with. There must be humility and forbearance in the church. Self must be overcome, and those looking for Christ's appearing must possess the power of endurance and self-control if they would have God's spirit with them. What do we seek today, brothers and sisters? Many times over the last two years, we have heard it ask for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. How can the Spirit of God be poured out without unity? How not can gonna happen? It's not going to happen, is it? Not going to happen. Unity and doctrine, you know. We have to have unity in understanding. Unity in doctrine, which will lead to unity of purpose. Some have been looking with a jealous eye upon the moves made at that point. <clears throat> they fear they should become Babylon if they organize. I was shown the churches in central New York have been perfect Babylon, confusion. And unless there can be a plan or system arranged whereupon the church can act, enforce, and carry out order, they have nothing to hope for. They must scatter into fragments. I was shown that Brethren Ross, Preston, and some others have been holding back, fearing to venture and adopt the only plan that can cause union of action and health of the body. Brother Wheeler's influence has not been right in this direction. After all the light given and the strong reasons presented, which none could gainsay, his course and the course of those of experience helping him in holding back is wrong and inexcusable in them. It is no virtue in them to wait until compelled to acknowledge that God is in this work by every difficulty being removed from their minds 
and no chance to resist any longer. This is not the course for experienced brethren to take. God is not pleased with these things. God requires them to venture out and bear some responsibility, as well as to have a few venture out and receive censure and dissatisfaction from others while they wait till the battle is fought and the instruments of God's choosing are wounded and faint. They choose to look on and see how the battle turns. They do not come up to the help of the Lord. I saw that Aros must be cautious of his words. He has not regarded slavery, slavery in a Bible light. He does not see it as God sees it. Brother Ross has expressed himself unguardedly and has exerted a wrong influence. He is watched, and he will surely be in a dangerous possession unless he strives to counteract the influence his words have carried. As a people, we must use great caution. As we do not engage in the war and pray for union and preach in regard to union, suspicions are aroused. And if one like Brother Ross expresses sentiments not fully comprehended, but taken that he favors the South, the people will be branded as secessionists. And in this excited state of the people, but a word would set them on fire and destroy our safety. Brother Ross's views are not correct in regard to the institution of slavery. This was a fine line that was being walked at that time. Many were dying. Many battles were being fought. Yet there were those within the church that were more in sympathy with those that were slaveholders than were understanding the word of God. Do we not find this same attitude today? The influence of teachers upon the body has not been right. They have not made known their decided faith and taken a firm stand that all might understand their position and know where to find them. These uncertain teachers who are unwilling to venture and bear any responsibility had better remain in silence until they can tell the time of the night and lead God's people safely and feed them with clean provender thoroughly winnowed. These uncertain teachers have nourished the elements of disunion and confusion. Each should look well to his own soul and rule his own spirit. If each would do this and watch self as eagerly as he watches his brethren, the elements of union would exist in the heart and every separating bar would be broken to fragments. Hearts would flow together like two drops of water. There would be power and strength in the ranks of Sabbath keepers far exceeding anything we have yet ever seen. We are living in a most solemn period. Satan and evil angels are arrayed against us with mighty power. The word, the world is on their side to help them. And the most lamentable fact is that professed Sabbath keepers claiming to believe important, solemn truth unite their forces with the combined influences of the powers of darkness to distract and hinder or tear down that which he has required his chosen instruments to build up. 
Some do not work directly to tear down, but indirectly. They look on with indifference. They express doubts. They express suspicion, fears, and need greater evidence than a doubting Thomas. They will not, or they will do not, put their hand to the work with zeal and exert their energies to build up. Their influence is recorded as one which retards the work of advance and reform among God's people. They look on with indifference. They express doubts, suspicion, fears, and they need greater evidence than a doubting Thomas. The evidence that Thomas required was to put his finger in the wounds and his hand in the side of Christ. Time will tell. Unfortunately, this is expressing just as much doubt as we are seeing here. Said the angel, those who do not gather with Christ scatter abroad. Matthew 12, 30. What do we see from this segment of the book of Matthew? What can we gain from this at this time? If I turn to it, If we begin to read this, this one little section, we have an example, a testimony given. There was brought unto him one possessed with a devil who was blind and dumb, and he, Christ, healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And the people were amazed and said, is this not the man, the son of of David. But the Pharisees heard it and said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself cannot stand. Was this not a quote widely attributed to Lincoln during the Civil War or just prior to the Civil War? I'm sorry, what? Was this quote not widely attributed with Lincoln either before or during the Civil War? I, I'm a house, not sure. A house divided against itself cannot stand oh yes yeah Martin that Luther made that in a speech Luther. didn't he i believe so what other brother was speaking please uh i thought martin luther martin luther king's mentioned that too okay to finish this portion of the bible i have one further question and if satan cast out satan he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. 
or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man? And then he will spoil his house. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. The warning is now given. A house divided against itself cannot stand. This house, this movement, showing no brotherly love, is divided against itself. How can we expect the outpouring of the Spirit of God the final outpouring of the Spirit of God, if we are so divided. There is no such thing as a neutral position. Everyone has influence, and his influence tells for or against. Individuals have stood ready to oppose every step of advance of God's people, as God in his providence has led them. Individuals have stood ready to oppose November 9th, July 18th, and they have shown their fruits by December 6th. And those who would venture out have their hearts saddened and distressed by the lack of union and action on the part of their ministering brethren. The case of Brother Sprague's wife was presented before me. She possesses an uncomplaining, kind, courteous spirit. She bears no ill will, no revengeful feelings. She feels interested for others, yet she makes no profession of our faith. She possesses a principle of right and amiable and excellent traits of character. If she would identify herself with God's people, acknowledge Jesus as her Savior, put away her unbelief, she would be an ornament to the Christian faith and would exert a powerful influence. Then God's people were presented before me. Oh, the lack of forbearance and patience with one another. The lack of brotherly love. The lack of meekness, of self-control while professing to be followers of Christ, subjects of his special grace. Oh, what a reproach to Christ. What a reproach to God's cause. Brethren and sisters professing his name suffer evil traits to appear in their lives, and they are stumbling blocks to those who have not professed to be Christ's followers. The reality of experimental religion and infidelity often blushes at the wayward course of professed Christians. The cause, the course, a brother Sprague's wife is a living example to those who profess to be transformed by the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And when the brethren and sisters lack love for one another and manifest selfishness and independence, unwilling to yield to one another, the course of brother Sprague's wife should silence their contentions. Her example is worthy of the imitation of those who profess to be Christians. Professed followers of Christ will have a fearful account to render to God for their wayward course. Angels are grieved and turn from them for their jangling and strife. They have furnished infidels with arguments against the reality of religion and of the truths of the Bible. 
the weakest saint in Roosevelt or central New York can be a powerful preacher by holy living, carrying out the truth in their lives. The weakest saint in this movement can be a powerful preacher by holy living, carrying out the truth in their lives. Consider That's this a good, great encouragement. Would you please repeat that? I said that's a great encouragement. I agree. Amen. Truths more sacred than any ever imparted to mortals upon the earth have been committed to our trust. Yet we as a people have not been faithful to our trust. Brothers and sisters, this was written in 1861. What truths followed this? What were be we being shown would come after this letter was written? The health message. The health message. Amen, brother. So, at what did he say? What did what did uh, Stephen say? The health message. Oh, okay. Because the health message had not been given in 1861. That powerful right arm of the gospel had yet to be given. Yet in 1861, she is being clear. Truths more sacred than any ever imparted to mortals upon the earth have been committed to our trust, yet we as a people have not been faithful to our trust. Our fruits have borne witness that our faith is weak and inefficient, unable to accomplish God's designs. Our unfaithful Sabbath keepers are the worst enemies the truth can have. There is power in the truth, and it will work a thorough reformation in the life when it takes hold of the heart. Many have taken hold of the truth, but the truth has not taken hold of them. What a statement! This is for us today. I was shown the apostasy of God's people. They have departed from God and are forming a union with the spirit of the world. When do we find in scripture where the people of God, the chosen of God, chose to form a confederacy with the spirit of the world. Where are we warned about this? great controversy from what I remember. Were not the people of God warned in the book of Judges and by Moses not to form a confederacy with the nations around them? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thinking of Balaam. How many times does God have to give us exactly that same warning before we have the capacity to understand it? I was shown the apostasy of God's people. They have departed from God and are forming a union a confederacy with the spirit of the world. As one fashion after another is introduced, one after another gradually falls back 
from their steadfastness and partakes of the spirit of the world and lose their peculiarity. It is a cross to the natural heart to be peculiar. We don't want to be the ones standing out. It is a cross to come out from the world and to be separate. What is the admonition of the Savior to us? Are we not told to take up our cross and follow him? And as individuals cease warring against the influence of the world and give up the conflict, they become Satan's easy prey. They become weary of the warfare and are taken in the snare. Little by little, the influence of the world steals upon them. And after the first step is taken to have friendship with the world, the next is prepared and darkness enshrouds them as they advance. And as they conform to the world, they lose the transforming influence of the spirit of God and their course does not look bad in their own eyes. They think themselves quite well off. They possess, they profess the truth. They don't mean to backslide, but they grow weaker and weaker. God's spirit is withdrawn. They are of the world. They are spewed out of the mouth of God, and they know it not. What warning are we given about those that would be spewed out of the mouth of God? And why is this important for us today? This is the message to the Laodicean church. Do we wish to accept this as being our position as being our condition at this time? Mm -hmm. Do we want to be spewed out of the mouth of God? Nope. There has not been so glaring a departure from God. It was gradual and they know not the time when God left them. For they were so assimilated to the world that heaven's light was withdrawn, and they were left blind, wretched, and naked. Again, the warning to Laodicea. They dress very nearly like the world, making just a little difference on account of their profession. Yet, where do we find those praying before the altar that know not that Christ is no longer before them? Are we not warned of this time as well? Well, yeah, we are warned. It's those guys are having Satan in front of them now as opposed to, or would have Satan stand in front of them if they're not paying attention to Jesus, got their eye on him, taking the water up from the, you know, the cup of the, <laughs> the hand. Right. Hoops I saw should be discarded from the ranks of Sabbath keepers. Their influence and practice should be a rebuke to this ridiculous fashion, which has been a screen to iniquity. Its first rise was from a house of ill fame in Paris. Never was such iniquity practiced as since this hoop's invention. Never were there so many murders of infants and never were virtue and modesty so rare. 
This has only increased in our time. It has almost departed from the enlightened land, and Sodom and Gomorrah will rise up in the judgment and condemn those who live in this enlightened age. For if they had had received the light which now shines upon the inhabitants of the earth, they would have repented long ago. But the people of the earth are filling the measure of the cup of their iniquity, and every soul who profess to be God's chosen peculiar people who imitates their example in any degree, will perish with them. God's people must cease dabbling with the spirit and practice of the world and preserve their peculiarity as those who profess to be separate from the world, dead to the world, not conformed to the world, but transformed by the renewing of their mind. Those who profess to have an heavenly inheritance must have the mind of Christ or they are not his children. God will have a separate and peculiar people. Their faith is peculiar. Their prospects are peculiar and glorious. And with the heavenly inducement presented before them, if they will not value it of sufficient importance to lead them to a separation from the fashions, extravagance, and practices of the world, they will receive their portion with them. The friendship of the world is at enmity with God. God calls upon us to elevate the standard. It has been left to trail in the dust. We are to pick up the standard. We are to hold that banner high. We are not to let it drop in the dirt. We must take an elevated position, but the fashions of the world would hold many of God's professed people in bondage. They so earnestly desire to have friendship with the world that they mangle their feelings and make wretched work of following Christ. They want heaven and this world too, but such will certainly lose both worlds. They can now take their choice in these hours of probation. Their fruits show their choice. And for a life of obedience, God will grant us the rich reward, but he calls for entire consecration and nothing short of this will he accept. <clears throat> I was shown Isaiah 3, verse 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. I saw that this text applies to these last days of peril. Why? Is this according to God's order? Where the children are in charge and the women rule over the men. What say you? I'd just have to say no. What? I'd have to say no. Uh, or, well, yes, whatever. What, re, rephrase, say your question again. If I, if I understand it right. If we read this verse again. As for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. And your question? Is this according to God's order? No. Yet, as Mrs. White was shown, this text applies to these last days of peril. Children are not generally controlled. They are suffered to come up with their wills unsubdued. I've seen the effects of this when this happens. I've observed the lives that are ruined when the will of the child is not subdued. They are indulged in pride, and at last the parents must yield to them. 
Children receive the sympathy of their mothers, and the mothers affect the fathers. Satan comes more readily to the women and children and works through them to influence the fathers. And then unitedly, without an opposing influence, they imperceptibly slide downward and yet have a name to live. But they are dead. <coughs> No name I saw of such stands registered in the book of life. When the progeny, when the child influence the mother, the church, then the order of God is disrupted. And no name as she saw, of these will stand registered in the book of life. Their professions are the same, yet God never counts by the profession. The acts, the works, the fruits testify to whom they belong. They are servants of the world, slaves to fashion, and the opinions of unbelievers have much weight with them. Those who have moral courage and the living principle with them will decide to be peculiar, to take their position and stand firmly. I was shown that perplexity and fear have seized all hearts. God is punishing this nation for their sins. The sin of slavery has long existed. It has been a curse to this nation. Now, as we are looking at this time frame, the sin of slavery has long existed. By 1861, it had existed in America for more than 70 years, maybe more than 100 years. It has been a curse to this nation. The cries and the groans and agony of God's creatures held in bondage, placed upon a level with brute creatures by their fellow men, have risen unto heaven. The fugitive slave law that went forth was calculated to crush out of man every noble, generous, feeling of sympathy that should arise in his heart for the oppressed and the suffering slave. It was in direct opposition to the teachings of Christ. God's scourge is now upon the North that they have so long submitted to suffer slavery to exist and that their fellow man to be held in hopeless slavery, tyrannized over and tortured just as passionate man chooses to act out the demon. If they murder their fellow men, no matter, he is considered no more than a brute by them. I saw that the inhabitants of earth have nearly filled the cup of their iniquity. Brother Woodruff, please return this to me at Battle Creek. If anyone wishes to retain a copy, he can copy it, but I wish the original. Sincerely, Ellen G. White. A note was added to this stating that this was recopied 4th of February, 2014 to include the last five paragraphs at which had been separated from the original and formerly filed as Manuscript 6, 1867. Now, we have one very short consideration to follow this. We have before us now letter 17 of 1861 written to W.S. Ingram. This was written from Battle Creek, and only portions of this letter were published in 10 manuscript releases, 22. Here again, this letter was written January 17th, 1861. 
for those of us paying attention, this will soon have a very interesting import. Dear brother, <clears throat> dear brother William Ingram, the past year has been a year of peculiar trials to me. It has been a year of discouragements and suffering. 24 days and 24 nights, we watched our suffering little one, but it seemed to be our Heavenly Father's will to take him from us. To what is she referring? I think that her was the death her first phone, wasn't it? I believe this is in reference to her last born. Is that their last one? I think it would be her first born, would it not? No. Because he died in 1863. Correct. Yeah, this is the youngest. We, right, yes, the last born, yes. Okay. So this is regarding John Herbert White. We feel to submit to his wise providence. Much of the time during his sickness, I was mourning and pleading before the Lord that if consistent with his will, my precious one might be spared. I could give vent to my feelings with bitter tears. But when my little one was dying, I could not weep. I fainted at the funeral, but although my heart ached to bursting, I could not shed a tear. For one week, this anguish pressed me. My mind was in a continual study as to why it should be so. Consider this carefully, brothers and sisters. John Herbert White was born 20th of September, 1860, and passed on the 14th of December, 1860. 85 days or 12 weeks and one day of age. This letter was written 119 days after his birth. Cause of death was noted as erephilius, a skin condition. Here again, Mrs. White is brought to her own 9-11. Mrs. White is brought to her own November 9th. All of this was taking place as she wrote the prior letter, as she was pregnant with John Herbert, and as the church was choosing its name, erecting the gates, following in the course of Jericho. And as is presented, this is also the 20th day of the ninth month. We could do the 20th day of the ninth month. Yep. That was presented in the chat. And yeah, so I'm wondering which, which day specifically. The day that the letter was written, or is it the day of, of his passing? And from the chat. He was born on the 20th, September. Okay. Yeah, so, so that September 20th becomes the 20th day of the ninth month. Okay. Okay. The, so that would be the day of his birth, right? 20th of September, 1860. 20th day of the ninth month. Is it not interesting that these 
symbols. These symbols of chronology are yet again being presented evidentially before us. Can we not have faith in our Heavenly Father that if he is leading his prophet at this time of darkness, that he is yet leading us? Can we not have faith that these symbols are presented for our own admonition? We could not rise above the discouragements we passed through in the past summer. As to the state of God's people, we knew not what we might expect. Satan had afflicted our best friends, those who knew us, those who were acquainted with our mission, and had seen the fruit of our labors and witnessed the manifestation of the power of God so many times. What could we hope for in the future? While my baby lived, I thought I knew what my duty was. I pressed him to my heart and rejoiced that at least for one winter, I should be released from, my, from any great responsibility, for it was not my duty to travel in winter with my infant. But when he was removed, I was again thrown into great uncertainty. The drowsy state of God's people nearly crushed me. Mm. This, is this not the state that we find ourselves today? A horror. Definitely an interesting parallel. It's a hard parallel to make. Yeah. A horror of great darkness came over me. I could not sleep through the night for a severe pain was in my heart. I could find no rest in any position in which I might lie. Finally, I fainted and continued to faint a number of times until my husband was seriously alarmed. He feared I must die. He sent for the brethren to come and pray for me. Their fervent and effectual prayers prevailed with God. I was relieved and immediately taken off in vision. I was not at this point able to do the research to find out which vision is being referenced here. The cause of God in different places was then presented before me. Many things you will see in pamphlet form, but individual cases were shown me which have occupied much of my time for two weeks in writing. I was shown some things in regard to you, Brother Ingram. I saw that the living pointed testimony has been crushed in the church. You have shunned to lay your hands decidedly upon wrong and have felt tried with those who have felt compelled to do so. Disaffected and crooked ones have had your sympathy, which has had a tendency to make you a weak man. And your feelings have not been in harmony and union with straight pointed testimony, which has been set home to individuals. Thou art the man. Second Samuel 12, 7. Interesting, is it not? That here again, we have this symbol of midnight when we look at the numbers in reverse. Here we have 12, 7 and reversed 7, 21. God's servants are not excused if they shun pointed testimony. They must reprove and rebuke individuals who deserve reproof and rebuke. You have too often stretched out your hand to shield those persons from the censure which they deserved and the reproofs which the Lord designed they should have. How much like Uriah Smith was Brother Ingram at this time. If these persons failed to reform, their lack is laid to your account. Instead of watching for their danger and warning them of it, you have felt tired 
You have felt tried with those who have followed the convictions of duty and have reproved and, re and warned the guilty. It is a fearful age. And the greatest danger now is of self-depreciation. Deception. Deception. Thank you. So I'll read that again. It is a fearful age, and the greatest danger now is of self-deception. Individuals are blind to their own fearful condition, reach the standard of piety which they and their friends have set up. Are we to reach a standard established by man, or are we to look and reach for the standard established by God? Uh, the latter, I would say. They are fellowshipped by their brethren and are satisfied, while they fail entirely to reach the gospel standard set up by our divine Lord. If they regard iniquity in their heart, the Lord will not hear them. Consider that carefully. With many, it is not only regarded in the heart, but openly carried out in the life. Yet in many cases, it receives no rebuke or censure. You have had feelings of opposition to the pointed straight testimony. Your feelings against James were all wrong at Cranes Grove at the time of the discussion, and you affected others. The work that God designed to have accomplished for certain ones proved a failure. If you had stood in the counsel of God at that time, a great work would have been done. The spirit of the Lord was grieved. Individuals were not corrected of their wrongs, and since that, have built themselves up, and you are guilty in this matter. I saw you sympathized with Horace Cushman, and your course in regard to him has injured and crippled your influence. It is impossible for Horace Cushman to be fellowshipped by the church. He has placed himself where his cause cannot be reached by the church where he cannot have any communion with or voice in the church. He has placed himself there in the face of light and truth. He has chosen his own course and cannot commune with God's people. He has followed the inclinations of his corrupt heart, and he has violated the holy law of God, and censure must ever rest upon him. If he repents ever so heartily, the church must let his case alone and not meddle with it. If he goes to heaven, it must be alone, without the sympathy or the fellowship of the church. A standing rebuke from God and the church must ever rest upon him, that the standard of morality be not lowered to the very dust. Brother Ingram, you must bear a living, pointed testimony and stand out of the way of the work of God and his people. Step not between God and his people and wrap up and smooth down the sharp testimony or lift your voice against the reproof and the severe censure he lays upon individual wrongs and sins. God is purifying his people. Stand out of the way that the work be not hindered. And instead of feeling opposition to cutting reproof and pointed testimony, use your influence to set it at home. A plain, smooth testimony God will not accept. Ministers must cry aloud and spare not. They must weep between the porch and the altar and cry, Spare thy people, Lord. You fail in your family. You fail in family government. You do not subdue evil temper and passion in your children. Your wife does not take hold with you that together you may correct and rule your own household. The Lord has given you a powerful testimony, but yet you lack and must be corrected upon these things or your testimony will dry up 
and you will be a weak man. I saw that Brother Lindsay has no duty to travel and preach. God has not laid the burden upon him. He lacks the essential qualifications. The Lord requires of him that he be not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Romans 12, 11. We are given many symbols. We are given many opportunities to turn and to stand. We are not to seek confederacy with the world. We are not to seek unions with the apostates. We are to stand as a peculiar people, living in yet separate from the world. What saith the Lord to you today? What saith the Lord through his word and through his prophet? That we may come into a clearer understanding of the cross that we are to carry. Any questions, thoughts, or comments at this time? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we have great need of you. There is no standard that we can set that comes close to your standard. Yet, Father, we have seen through our lack of love, our lack of brotherly love, one for another, that your banner has been allowed to trail in the dust. Be with us today, Father. Direct us today on this Sabbath. Help us that we may come together, that we may understand that which you would have us to know. We thank you, Father, for the words of your prophet. We thank you for your words of your scripture. Help us now that we may more clearly understand that which we need, that we need to be able to accept so that our own lives will become a living example for you and of your character at this time. To this end, we ask for this, we praise you and thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.